Video games do a lot of things wrong. <laughs> I've recorded three Just Sayings in a row, and the first one was video game worlds are so incredible and capable of so many things, and what a medium. So now to weigh that out, because it's important that we karmically balance out the universe, something that this show is responsible for, video games can be really crap. Largely, when video games are crap, it's because people with money make them crap, because they make bad choices. And then we end up with the consumer unfriendly practices or calls or what ends up on the cutting room floor that results in a product that's nowhere near as good as it should have been. And that's a massive shame. It's interesting that I brought up something ending up on the cutting room floor because what I'm talking about today is a video game sin that no one's talking about. They probably are, but no one in my room is talking about it right now, except me. I'm talking about it. This is the video game sin Jessica is talking about. A related sin that people do talk about all the time is when nothing is left on the cutting room floor, which is video game bloat, or perhaps video game bloat, which is to say worlds that are too big but empty, characters without anything interesting to say, endless quests because a settlement needs your help, regurgitating and repeating missions, dungeons, you name it. It's quantity over quality when it comes to content. And I think what's happened there to create the bloat is there's a disconnect between what what was foreseen as the plan and then what was actually able to be achieved within the budget and time that the people with the plan allotted to the people who make the game. Money to devs, money decide time, decide budget, down to devs, devs do their best, poor devs. It's the issue when big is seen as good, like big equals good, without any other classifications. You know what it reminds me of? That Roll Dahl meme. And uh, when it goes, oh, the publisher's like, so you gave us a book about a friendly giant and then an enormous crocodile. And then the one where granny has this magic medicine and grows as big as a house, what's next? And Roald Dahl's like, there's this peach. And the publisher goes, is it? And Roald Dahl's like, it's huge. Anyway, that's a funny meme. Doesn't have a lot to do with this video actually, but I wanted to tell you because I thought you would think it's funny. But I think the problem there is, as I said, there's a disconnect between intention and then execution. And I think that's the video game sin no one is talking about, that what's worse is not the size of the world, it's what then that sacrifices. You'd rather have an Outer Worlds or Cat Quest 3 size game where everything is a tick, everything is worth seeing, worth exploring. And if you are going to have an enormous world, then it should offer the same amount of quality per, you know, per square mile. I'm talking about like a Red Dead Redemption 2 world or a, an Elden Ring world, or even if we're not talking an open world, a Persona 5 Royal. If you are going to have a game that has 100 hours, 150 hours that people are expected to spend there, you have to keep delivering them quality, not just You'll always have something to do, even if that something isn't particularly interesting. I think the sin specifically that I'm getting at is insidious bloat. And I think insidious bloat is the crappiest kind because you don't see it coming. Unlike a situation where we now get suspicious when a developer or rather a publisher says, we have an enormous game world. Now we're just like, okay, but can you fill it? Now it, we do have a, a little bit of like a consumer hesitation, market awareness about that particular kind of sell. But the insidious bloat I'm talking about is really evident in, I'm gonna keep talking about similar games because they're the games that I played most recently. In Cat Quest 1, uh, the <laughs> inferior version of Cat Quest 3, before they really nailed down the Cat Quest, there's, and to be fair, this was their first game. I'm not coming at General Bros. I think it's a great game. There was a certain set of side quests that genuinely had you running from end to end 
of the bottom half of the continent for no other reason than it just took up time because there wasn't too much to do once you got there it's just that they were like hey go to the east port go to the west port and you had to do this back and forth like six times that's insidious bloat it's the bloat that creeps in that you notice and you don't know until you're in the middle of it i equated to things like forced slow walking ah oh, cyberpunk when you can't fast travel from uh, in the middle of the street you have to go get to a fast travel location even if you've identified all the fast travel points it's things like oblivion when you get to the end of a cave before i think skyrim was the first game that would blessedly include an extra unlockable door or cave wall section that would bring you straight back the, to the entrance. These are things that respect a player's time and insidious bloat is the opposite of that is a total disrespect of the player's time and offers them nothing in return for it. Now, there's an argument to be made that staying in the cyberpunk world for longer while you walk to a fast travel point, that's not the end of the world and neither is something like heading back to the top of a cave entrance because I guess they can't all have invisible doors that you just didn't happen to see from where you were or drops that you can only drop down and not climb up. But I feel like when it comes to realism, we would like to suspend and let us get back to what we were doing. Hunting Nern Root or Nur Root. I can't remember. I think it's Nern Root. <laughs> one of the worst examples that I encountered recently, and this is a tricksy one. It's in Hellblade 2. And I want to highlight that I I think this is, is a really good example of what happens with the disconnect between a publisher or what is set out as the intention and then what is not, uh, not executed on a capability level, but reeks of there being an execution issue in that I suspect deadlines were coming up too soon. There wasn't enough budget. There wasn't enough people to work on this section. It's what happens whenever you see a game that feels unfinished, but this is sort of worse than unfinished. Now, to explain my point, you go into sections where you need to do those sorts of puzzles that you might remember if you played the first game. Essentially, you see a rune and then you have to recreate that rune in the environment. Very similarly, uh, there are these water bubble puzzles where you can uh, slightly contort the level around you and you need to do that a few times to uh, reach this ultimate platform and move forward. Now, in a few sections in the game, these are done to great effect. They feel like the first game. They feel like, uh, like genuinely intriguing, beautiful moments. The game looks fantastic. Uh, and the bubble puzzle is a nice change on the original. For the majority of the time though, these are tedious. It is incredibly clear where you're supposed to go the entire time. They're not really puzzles, they're just holding you up. And there are things where it's very clear that the only thing I can equate the level design in these puzzle sections to is like a shopping mall layout. Now, if you don't know, the way shopping malls are laid out is because consumerism and capitalism, they're designed to make it impossible for you to get from point A to B without passing the maximum amount of stores. And that's how Hellblade 2 feels. It feels like it's padding out its runtime by having you needlessly walk in circles. And boy, does Senua walk slowly as well. It really does feel like there's about three hours in there that are spent on these needless, slow puzzling sections where there is absolutely none of your brain that needs to be engaged. You're just very aware that you need to do this circle, go up there, click this, that circle, go over there. And that would be fine if you were running through that, but you have to move through it all so slowly and the animations take so long and it's just so unsatisfying. And that is the kind of insidious bloat where it just, it feels like the game is holding you back because it 
wants to pad out its runtime and have you spend more time in its world. And the reason I say that I think this is a victim of the dissonance between a publisher and a developer is because especially having played the first game, I don't think the intention was to go out and create these sections that didn't actually require much puzzling, that didn't uh, require lateral thinking or intelligence to needle out. I don't think that's what they wanted. But as a result of whatever might have happened, that's what we got. There are also a bunch of sections in the game where it just takes so long to walk from place to place. The conversations are not Red Dead level intriguing enough to excuse the walking pace and the dialogue and the little bits of story that are being exchanged between your companions. It's not bad, but it's another section where it just really sinks in that you're experiencing a drawn out process that is adding minutes to that runtime. And perhaps this is cynical, but it feels like it's happening so that the publisher can say this is an x hour game not because it needed any of that a really good example and something i think feeds into my theory that there was a bunch of things the developers wanted to do and couldn't do uh two different things one is there's only like two of those rune puzzles in the entire sequel. And those rune puzzles were everywhere in the first game and they were genuinely challenging, many of them. And the second is you tend to run across moments. Like there's one where some uh, a character says, uh, we need to perform a ritual and then it will draw out the giant. And, and that's the next thing we're gonna do. And it's like, all right, well, we gotta find the right place to do it, okay. And then you start to head off and then it just like swaps to a cutscene, and it's like, we're here. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. I guess we were five meters from um, the best ritual location. Nice, very good, handy clearing, appreciate it. And it's like, boom. It's not even did they find the spot for the ritual. They're just doing it. Like they do it right away. And perhaps in a way that's good. That's not padding out time. But the way that sometimes things like that would move so fast, and then move so slowly that not only were they not challenging, you can see the strings. And I think that's what bothered me the most. I'm not a game developer. It uh, is in a way this sort of magic to me. And I have a lot of admiration for people who develop games, but it's strange when you're in those levels and you can just basically see the 3D environment. Sometimes uh, when when she's having visions, you realize that you're just walking back the way that you just came. It's just that there is a different lighting and galaxy field that's set over it. So the game is hoping you don't notice that really what you've done is walk all the way down, experience a narrative moment, and now you're just walking all the way back to a boss fight. And I imagine these are things that happen in video game development a lot. It just feels really strange to notice it. It's kind of like how they say that the best editing of a movie should be imperceptible. Like amazing editing, you won't notice that it's being done almost ever. And I feel like that's probably the way that these things pan out. It, it, that's not to say that editing is, is second rate or doesn't matter. <laughs> Dan, I'm an editor too, it's okay. <laughs> Blank will remember this. Uh, for, the, for, don't, um, quite apart from just this. Uh, and then let you go. Uh, oh. It's to say that it should seamlessly fit with everything else. But when you're between fumbling with uh, a, a clumsy level design that is sending you through escalators like a shopping mall does and holding the shift button or whichever button is keeping you walking half a pace faster while still walking than if you weren't holding it, that's when it really sinks in and, and starts to feel like a bloat that you wouldn't have known about going in because that's not really something people talk about we know about overly long games we know about games that outstay their welcome we know about maps that are too big but it's it's this kind of restraining you from being able to sadly 
finish the game in six hours and enjoy it more and instead be held back for an extra four and enjoy it less. But again, I think that that comes down many times to publishers make those choices. Publishers want a 10 hour game and not a six hour game. And I think that's an ongoing difficulty. I have the most admiration and respect for game developers. It seems like a really hard thing to do. Uh, so I take back the first thing I said. There's not lots of bad things about video games. Well, there is, but mostly they're amazing. And that's why we talk about them with complexity. We talk about the things that we adore and our bugbears and everything in between because they are an art form and a discipline that deserves to be discussed. Like everything that's worth talking about, video games are worth talking about because they elicit different perspectives. There's thought on the art itself, the medium, the creators, the context with which uh, each title appears, the the state of the industry and, and everything else. And that's why I like saying these things to you. And I've been saying them and I hope that you've enjoyed listening. I'm just saying, and you're just listening. So why don't you get into that comment section and just comment, just com just comment. Cause I'll just read it. Wow. 